welcome everybody to the fourth or fifth of our annual updates uh, on research in Alexander disease. Um, I'm Albie Messing from University of Wisconsin in Madison, and we're joined this morning also by Amy Waldman from Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. Um, some very important things happened this past year, and we're very happy to have the opportunity this morning to uh, to discuss them with you and, and answer whatever questions um, that we can. For the regulars uh, who've been here before, um, you probably remember the routine. The um, the chat function on uh, Adobe, which I guess is really only available if you have a phone or sorry, if you have a tablet or a computer, um, can be used to write in um, any questions as we go along. And then, um, you know, if, if it's a really critical question, uh, um, we'll stop and answer them. Otherwise, we um, will probably uh, wait until the end and then and then try to um, address all of the questions at once. Um, and also, uh, I wanted to have the video on when we started, but to just give more room on the screen for the slides, um, at this point, I'll turn the video off and, and then come back to this later. Actually, I don't know if um, Dr. Waldman, do you have access to video from your computer? If you do, you sh should click it on to wave hello. I'm not sure if she does. Um, OK, so let's go ahead. So at the beginning, let me um, just make some general comments and introductions. Um, Clark Kellogg is um, here again to help. If you have any problems with the connection, you can call him at that telephone number, 608-263-8726. Or um, his email address is Kellogg, that's K-E-L-L-O-G-G, -G, at Waisman, which W-A-I-S-M-A-N dot W-I-S-C. Edu. Um, in terms of events to look forward to in the coming year, I, I did want to mention. Whoops, I did want to mention the United Luca Dystrophy Foundation annual meeting will be uh, June 23rd and 24th in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I'm not sure whether Alexander disease will have any presence at that particular meeting, but I think what's um, more important is that we're going to have an Alexander-only uh, patient family conference in Madison, uh, Wisconsin this year. Some of you may remember that we that that the ULF hosted one such conference a long time ago, 2008, in Illinois, and this is really just the second one of these conferences. But this time, it'll be in Madison. Uh, so. Uh, let me pause for a minute because I think there may be some technical issues that Clark wants to tell me about. No, just have one person. Okay, we'll go ahead. So let me say a few minutes, uh, a few things about the conference um, planned for this summer. Um, we have uh, nine speakers um, confirmed for this who come from our uh, NIH-funded. Uh, program project that's been active for many years, um, as well as a few other people who uh, have, I think, valuable things uh, to contribute to this discussion, and also uh, representatives from or one of the scientists from the pharmaceutical company that we've been working with a lot over the past few years. Um, the uh, the general schedule will be that they'll, there's going to be a, uh, an informal dinner on Friday night, August 3rd, and then the presentations are going to be uh, Saturday, August 4th. Um, we'll provide all the, uh, the food for these um, uh, these sessions, at least the continental breakfast on, on Saturday. Um, and the registration is free, but, um, but we would really appreciate it if you do register for this so that we have an idea of how, how, how large the group will be and we can plan appropriately for uh, the room size and, and the amount of food. Um, we do encourage you to book hotels and flights now because 
There is another big event taking place in Madison at the same time, CrossFit Games, which is something uh, I know nothing about, but apparently it's taking up a lot of hotel space um, in in the city. Um, there's a website that's shown on this slide um, that you can go to for a lot of details of available hotels and, and other aspects of this of this conference. So um, we hope to see you there in um, in August. Uh, in the past, I've um, I use, I've spent part of these sessions giving a, a general overview of, of Alexander disease for people who are really new to the disorder. But um, this year is going to be a little different. And also, fortunately, I'll, um, uh, I can refer people to a short book that um, I, I just finished last year. So I'll, I'll make a brief plug for this. Um, it's about 50 or 60 pages long. Uh, it's a guide for patients, written specifically as a guide for patients and families. Um, it's available as either a paperback, an ebook, um, or also a hardcover. You can order it from Amazon.com or um, or directly from uh, from the publisher. Um, whatever proceeds I get from this are being donated to the Wasteman Center for uh, supporting the search on Alexander disease. So. Um, a lot of general and background questions that people have um, really are, are addressed in this book. So, um, so you know, I, I encourage you to take a look at it and see if, if you're interested. Um, really, the only story this year uh, is the one that's just um, coming out this month in um, the journal Annals of Neurology on a, um, a an approach for treatment in Alexander disease. And honestly, this is something we've been working on. Some of you know we've been working on it for um, a long time, almost 15 years. This particular approach we've, we've been um, working on for about four years. And so we're very excited that it all seems to have come together in this past year. And now it's out um, in the public. So, so really, the goal of today's session is to walk people through this study and explain what it really means, um, what it doesn't mean, and what it offers as a, um, a path to, um, to, to a clinical treatment. So um, I should say that we, we did this as a collaborative effort, collaborative effort with a number of scientists at Ionis Pharmaceuticals, especially Barrett Powers, shown uh, on the left-hand side. And the person in my lab who's been really leading this effort um, is Tracy Hageman on the right-hand side. So up until a few minutes ago, the order of topics today was going to be first walking through this, this paper and talking about this antisense approach um, from what are referred to as preclinical studies, preclinical meaning um, anything before humans. And then the second portion was going to be um, by Amy Waldman, um, what more is needed to do a proper clinical trial um, of this this treatment approach. And um, some of you are already familiar with the natural history studies from from that are going on at CHOP. Um, but for scheduling issues, uh, we just realized we needed to flip this order. So what I'm going to do now is jump ahead to slide 48. And um, and then let Dr. Waldman take over. So um, I think I could do that maybe um, by going right to here. Yes. Okay. So um, Amy, uh, why don't you take it away? And make sure your microphone is turned on. Right, so Amy, we can't hear you yet. Oh, how about that? Did that work? Yes, 
Uh, yes, now we can hear you. All right, and then here I am. There we go. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Amy Waldman. I've had the privilege of meeting many patients with Alexander disease and many children with Alexander disease as well as the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And I apologize for um, the interruption of the order of today's talk. Really, the, the most of the webinar is going to be concentrated on Dr. Messing's work, uh, but we don't want to interrupt that. Um, and unfortunately, because of a commitment with my husband and my children, I have to leave at um, noon Eastern time to make sure that I'm on time for our family obligations. So I wanted to just briefly mention what the purpose of our research is at CHOP and, and what we've learned through meeting all of our families. Um, there we go. Okay. So what we're talking today about is mostly research, not clinical care. So a natural history study differs from regular, what I call clinical care, in that we're collecting information about individuals with a disease in order to inform clinical trial design and knowing whether a drug works. So you're going to hear all about um, a therapeutic strategy and how it works in mice, but we need to understand if it's going to be given to humans, how it will impact the disease. What will change? What might not change? It, will the MRI improve? There's a lot of questions, and then to answer those questions, we need to um, run this natural history study. So this is not a disease registry. That's where you just get a list of patients with the disorder. The intent of this natural history study is really for the drug development and what we call clinical trial readiness. And again, this is different than clinical care. So before I get into a lot of detail, you know, people can come to CHOP with Alexander disease and participate in research only where they just do the research evals and there's no cost to the patient. Or they can choose to come for a clinical visit where I give medical advice, I make recommendations about what might or may not be best for um, a child or an adult with the disease. Um, and that can be done during the same visit, um, but that would be billed to insurance because of clinical care. So we have been so fortunate to have been contacted by probably over 100 patients around the world. Um, we have their, their home country for about 86 of them. About half of these have come to CHOP um, and have gone through the evaluations that I'll go over in a minute. So this is just where our patients are that have contacted us. Certainly there are many more families around the world um, with this disorder, and we will put our contact information at the end if you're interested in participating in any of our studies. So what we're trying to do through this um, study is explore the symptoms that led to the diagnosis of Alexander disease. And sometimes it's a short journey, and sometimes it's a long journey. So sometimes it might take the medical profession years to make a diagnosis, or there might be some complex genetic te testing that leads to the diagnosis. And in other cases, it might be relatively a uh, shorter journey, um, such as having a seizure or leading to an MRI that might lead to the diagnosis. But we're very interested in the delay in diagnosis, so why are medical professionals not recognizing the symptoms? And also want to make sure that families are understanding the symptoms of the disease. So, for example, it is not uncommon to end up with GI um, exploring eating problems that are not recognized to be a symptom of Alexander disease until way later when someone thinks to do an MRI. So this is all very informative to us and allows us to better what we call phenotype the patients, to understand how patients are similar and how they're different um, from a clinical perspective, but then also from a genetic mutation perspective when we look at their GFAP mutation. As many of you probably have read, there's different ways to classify Alexander disease. We can do it by age, and this is what's classically in the literature in terms of the proportions of patients that have the different uh, phenotypes. Or we could do it by symptoms and MRI, which is more what we call a phenotype-based description of the disease. Um, I did notice a question on the side. What is your age frame for the research? Any age, infant up to adult. Um, thank you to all my adults that may or may not be on the line. Um, that have come to a children's hospital. We like to think that we're a nice, colorful place with um, wonderful people. But yes, a lot of adults that are, are um, clearly not pediatric patients anymore um, have been very generous and have come visited us and I hope benefited from the experience. So we see patients of any age. So I want to just introduce clinical trial design. So when you do a clinical trial, that is the ultimate study with a first in human drug. And this is to show efficacy and safety. So does the treatment work 
and is it safe? And here are the different things, the different types of clinical trials. It's called phase one or phase two or phase three. In rare diseases, phase one studies are very, very rare because we're not going to necessarily give a drug to a normal volunteer. This is a different type of therapy and that's not appropriate. So what we kind of do in most cases is what we call phase one slash two study where we give a new drug to patients with the disease to demonstrate safety and efficacy um, to an extent. Does the drug work? And what we ultimately need to do is pick just one measurement, just one, as what's called our primary outcome to determine if the drug works. Now we can measure quite a lot of information in a clinical trial. But unfortunately, we can only pick one. And not for today's call, but I'm very, very interested in the Alexander disease community. What if we could only make one improvement in symptoms of this disease, what would it be? Some people say walking. Some people say talking. Some people say swallowing, choking, and vomiting. Um, and so we really have some challenges ahead of us in trying to pick one measure or combine different measures into a composite measure and call that our single measure. It's a little way of cheating. Um, but it actually comes quite complicated when it comes to the FDA and determining whether a drug works. So we have a lot of information, but we are very interested in your point um, of what is important to you. And that's some of the things that we're trying to ascertain through the study. Um, we think that we're measuring um, some important things as measured here, so gross motor function, um, hand function, manual abilities, the ability to eat and drink, and the ability to communicate. These are things that we obviously think are very important to our overall quality of life. But we will, maybe at the family conference or through questionnaires that we would email to everyone, um, might start asking you some questions about what's important to you and what's most meaningful to you. These are descriptions of how people are doing, level one being pretty normal function to level five being um, uh, most dependent for their function. We also might ask you about if you were walking with normal function but then needed some help on curbs or going upstairs and then needed help with mobility devices like a walker or a wheelchair. We're very interested in what ages these things occurred at for patients with Alexander disease so we can start to put together a time frame of symptoms and understand timing of um, neurologic um, changes. And so that way we can go to the FDA and say, well, it's unlikely that walking will change in a year or two years or five years, but it might at some other time. And this is information that we are very um, critical on getting, this is critical information that we need from our patients. Then when patients visit CHOP, we actually put them through a lot of gross motor, fine motor, um, speech, language, and swallowing tests so that we can get those different measures across ages to say how a patient is doing and how they're functioning. And then we can measure change over time. And so that's going to be incredibly important if we have a baseline evaluation and we give a drug and then we repeat the evaluation, we want to measure change. And that becomes a very tricky thing to design and that's one of my um, areas of interest and expertise. Um, one of the interesting things is the MRI scan. And we have asked a lot of our patients to consider doing an MRI scan at CHOP. Um, as part of the research, there is no fee to the insurance or the patient. Um, but the MRI scan, which is optional, helps us to understand disease progression in a different way. So how do we compare a patient with Alexander disease that looks like this? And this is, I'm not going to go through sort of the, the different findings on these scans. But how do you compare different scans and different individuals, and how do we look for change again in a clinical trial? So we're very Im interested in imaging. Um, and we're also very interested in GFAP in humans. And Albie will talk about this in the mice shortly. Um, and this is from Albie's older work. Again, if patients are willing to go through a spinal path, and we know that, again, that is an optional procedure as part of the research. No one is forced to do any of this. It's all voluntary. We have been able to measure GFAP in spinal fluid in Alexander disease patients, and we have some healthy controls banked that we used. And our GFAP data looks a little similar to this, where patients with Alexander disease have elevated GFAP, and our controls actually are quite low. 
all the way sort of down here. And so there's a very obvious difference in a patient with Alexander disease in measuring this protein compared to healthy individuals. And we're trying to ask a number of questions about the GFAP. You know, does this person have a different type of disease than this person? Or is it random? You know, is it always elevated? If there's change over time, is it always going to stay about the same, or does it start up high and then drop low, or does it start up low and then, then go high? So we're trying to ask a number of questions about how to measure GFAP, because as you'll hear, it becomes an important um, outcome when we're looking at the, the mice work that um, Albie's about to present. So how can you help? First of all, I have to say we would not be where we are if it wasn't for the Alexander disease patient community, and I am so grateful that as of March, we will have about 45 international patients, you know, from the U.S. And, and from other countries around the world who have come to CHOP in just over two years, about two years and two months. Um, so it is incredible the sacrifices that you have made. And in doing so, we have learned so much about the clinical um, phenotype and the MRI phenotype of this disease. We're starting to make some, you know, changes in some people's clinical care based on what we've learned, and it really has been a tremendous experience, you know, for me, both personally meeting all these families and professionally in the fact that we we're able to really make uh, a difference, I hope, um, in everyone's lives. So we would love for as many patients as possible to come visit us at CHOP. We are working on funding. Funding is always um, challenging, and so we're working on additional funding to allow us to bring more patients to CHOP. Um, we know that travel is extraordinarily expensive, and Philadelphia is not um, an inexpensive city, and we are trying to get travel funds to help. Right now, the problem is, you know, if we, if we offer that, we need a, um, an endless supply of money to continue to offer that. It's, it's not fair to bring people to CHOP um, and then not be able to pay for their visit the next time or the next time, but we're, we're working on different travel resources to bring families in. Um, and if you do choose to come in, we could do our clinical visit, we could do all of the research visits, and we could talk about whether an MRI or a spinal tap is something that you'd be interested in doing. For patients who really want to help but are not able to come to CHOP, if you could share as much information about yourself, your child, as possible, that would be most helpful. We would take anything, you know, letters, emails, um, timelines, you know, anything that you have about your child, medical records and MRI scans on disk. If you want to participate and send us your local medical records, we will review them. And then we are, we are very much trying to do telephone interviews where I reach out to you and ask some questions so that I really understand your journey. It's not quite the same as coming into CHOP, um, and unfortunately, the timing is always challenging. We tried to do one yesterday, and, and I didn't realize that they weren't on the same time zone, um, and calling international pose more challenges than it should have. But um, we, we do our best to try to arrange these phone calls um, when we can, and I apologize for all of you who have reached out to me that I have not had a chance to get back to. I'm sort of stretched pretty thin and try to um, uh, try to reach out as much as I can. I do want everyone to know, though, that I think about the patients with Alexander disease that I've met and that I haven't met all the time. And so you are very special to all of us at CHOP, and even though I'm probably not the best communicator through email um, or phone calls, I do think about you and your children quite often, um, all day long. Um, this is the contact information for Jerry Liu, um, who is our study contact. She is our research manager. She does an amazing job. I think she's on the line, and many of you know her, and I would, be, I would never be able to do any of this if it weren't for her. So thank you all to Jerry, um, who has been in touch with many of you. Um, and if you want to mail us records, here's my contact information so that we can look at the MRIs and the medical records if you have them. And then, you know, I have to thank the, the research team. Sorry, I tried to correct Albie's. Um, um, credentials, but it, it ended up covering poor Tim's face there. Um, this, these are just some of the faces that you'll meet at CHOP when you come visit us. Um, I would not be able to do this without everyone here on this slide. And then finally, I really do need to thank Elisa's Corner and Iona's Pharmaceuticals for the funding. You know, my um, division chief at CHOP told me that I was allowed to see eight Alexander disease patients for research, and then I would have to stop. Um, and because of Elisa's Corner, we never had to stop. We never had to put the study on hold. We've been able to continue to bring in patients, and Ionis has provided additional funding to allow us to get the MRIs and the spinal taps and measure GFAP, and we would not be able to do any of this if it wasn't for their support. So I'm incredibly grateful. 
All right, so that's the end of my remarks. If anyone has any questions for me, and then we'll turn it over to the star of our show, Dr. Rumpling. Actually, Amy, um, yes. I'll start with a question um, because I, I know it's on many people's minds. Can you say a little bit about the clinical trial design, um, like, like where we are in clinical trial design in terms of um, how many people might be participating and how it's likely going to be a fairly narrowly defined group in the initial trial? Yep. So. You know, I'm not trying to purposely be effusive in answering that question. The truth is we don't know. In the beginning, um, you know, we, we, these are active conversations. In the beginning, we thought that we would just be doing a combination phase one, phase two study, and that we would be looking at an efficacy endpoint. Does the disease, um, does the, do the symptoms get better? Do we see an improvement in walking? Do we see an improvement in speech? You know, we, that was the initial idea behind the study design. More recently, we've been talking about maybe doing more of a an earlier phase trial where we give the drug to an, a certain number of, of patients to see if GFAP only improves. So more of a biomarker discovery and less of a patient-based trial. So all of these things are still on the table. I should, though, make it very clear that there, we are not in a trial yet. We, we cannot take patients for any clinical trial just yet. We will share with the community as soon as we're ready to do so. We do not know yet the age, the disease type, or um, the, the disease duration. We don't know any of those details yet. I want to be very open and honest that some conversations have come up with, well, what if you only use newly diagnosed patients? And that might be disappointing to everyone on the line. And I, as a researcher, then need to say to the FDA, well, only X number of new patients are diagnosed every year, which, of course, we all know is very, very low. And we would never be able to complete a, a clinical trial if we only took patients that were within the first few months of diagnosis. Or I say to the FDA, well, well let's think about this. Someone who's newly diagnosed as a child or a teenager, for example, whose first symptom was when they were a baby but it wasn't recognized, is that patient really truly newly diagnosed or is that patient someone who had a long diagnostic odyssey that no one recognized the disease? So I'm, I'm trying the best that I can to steer away from those types of trials, but they have been discussed and I should make sure that everyone's aware that age limits have been proposed or other things. And I'm trying to be very thoughtful about does that biologically make sense? Does that physiologically make sense? How can we prepare for that if it happens? I have become very attached to all of the families that I've met at CHOP, and so my goal would be to give the drug to everybody. I don't know what the trial's going to be yet, um, and I'm not trying to hide anything. I just don't think our discussions have really evolved to all of the details yet. With many clinical trials, there is a inclusion criteria that will set some of these things. As we know more, we will certainly share it with everyone. I just need everyone to understand that I'm trying my best to advocate that this drug would be given to every individual. The question that came in, can we participate in a clinical trial from India? We're trying to figure out whether or not um, CHOP would hopefully be the, the main site of a clinical trial. I think that that's um, that nothing, none of this has been established, but I think that that's where we're moving. We're trying to, to, to consider whether or not an international site, um, Europe has been proposed, um, and another U.S. site would be able to participate in a clinical trial. We haven't necessarily recognized anyone in Asia um, or South America to participate in a trial just yet. We would take patients from anywhere in the world. And, um, again, I don't know resources to bring international patients to the U.S. We don't know what that's going to look like yet, but our goal would be to treat anyone from around the world. We just have to figure out whether they can physically get to CHOP. So there's a question, what if you can't put an age frame? I mean, my child stayed stable through the years. I'm not quite sure what the specifics of that question is. Um, my hope would be that we would be able to include anyone with a diagnosis of Alexander disease, but it depends on what the outcome measure 
will be to be able to to make those inclusion criteria. So we, I think everyone just needs to know if if there if your loved one is not eligible for a clinical trial or our first clinical trial in Alexander disease, I am thinking of other strategies that may be able to help your child. And so, uh, again, I'm not ready to share any of those just yet, but please know that I advocate as hard as I possibly can for patients, and I will continue to do so. It would be my goal that as many patients that are physically able to come to CHOP or to one of our sites would be able to get drug. Um, records are not available to me from the NIH or Dr. Schiffman's research without your express consent that those records can be shared. Um, Dr. Schiffman might be able to share them. Um, the NIH might have separate rules, but either way, I would need a consent form to be able to access any of those records, just to protect patient privacy. I think I got most of those questions. Oh, estimated time frame. I purposely clipped over that one, huh? Estimated time frame about when the trial is going to begin. Um, again, I don't want to put a time frame out there because what if I'm wrong? What if things take longer than expected? Um, you know, it is within a few years. I will, I've been saying that sort of consistently. Our goal is that it's, it's um, you know, of course, shortening that as much as we possibly can. But within a few years, we're optimistic that we'd be able to start our first clinical trial. So actually, let me jump in on that question as well. And um, I'll go over some of those uh, issues in my portion of the presentation. There are still um, certain things that have to be achieved in order for us to get to a clinical trial. And, um, and so we cannot say with absolute certainty um, that a clinical trial will happen, even though we're all extremely optimistic now. And I think for the first time we have sort of a clear path towards a clinical trial. But there are a number of other steps that we have, to, a number of other hoops that we have to jump through before we get there. And um, I, I think it will be more obvious what I mean by that once I get through all of my stuff. So the last thing that I'll, I will say before we turn it over to Dr. Messing. So the FDA is our friend. Um, you have to understand what the FDA is looking for. I have tremendous respect for the FDA, and my background and training actually was not in Alexander disease. My background and training is all in clinical trial design and clinical trial methodology. So the FDA is not obstructionary to this process at all. In fact, they have done a lot to try to help move this along and help with rare disease. So um, the FDA is actually not the problem. The problem is that we don't have enough data to go to the FDA um, with how things are going to change. And that's where I'm so grateful for all the families that have come to CHOP to allow us to get the measurements that we need. Um, and I know there's many out there that would wish they could come to CHOP, but because of, of real life reasons, um, including, you know, traveling uh, far with a, um, you know, a, a an individual that's not completely healthy can be challenging. Um, but any information that you can share with us um, has been extraordinarily helpful. We don't want to get it wrong. We don't want to say, oh, well, the most important thing with Alexander disease patients is changing in, in for example, their walk, but the, the drug doesn't show change in the ability to walk, and then the drug wouldn't be available to patients if we can't show that there's change in some measures of function. So the FDA actually does a lot to, um, to really help this process, and they're not the problem. We're just data collection, from my standpoint, is what's um, the biggest priority right now. All right, I'm looking at the okay. other, so maybe we should turn it over to Albie. Yeah. yeah, so if there are no more questions, again, we can come back to many of this at, at many of these things um, at the end, and, and I'll try my best to answer them as I can, as well as I can. So um, I think with that, let me see if I can go back to the other slides. Uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. Yeah, so let me go to this, and um, Amy looks so good on the video that I think I'll turn mine on. 
So, uh, but Amy, you probably have to turn yours off. There we go. There we go. All right. Um, so, as I said before, really what I want to accomplish in my portion is to walk everyone through this study, which has um, been a long time in the making. Uh, and and so we're very happy that it's now finally in the public sphere. And um, I should say that even though the book that I mentioned, I think does a, a really, it basically says everything I know about Alexander disease. Um, but um, what it doesn't talk about is this new um, option for uh, a new path for treatment. It makes very brief mention of it, um, but this book was finalized before the, um, the pu our publication was accepted in Annals of Neurology, and so I couldn't really put much um, in much detail into the book. Um, you know, when I revise the book, probably in a year, I'll, I'll add I'll add what I'm about to say about about this paper. Okay, so let's go to the topics. Uh, oh, so the uh, what I want to cover now are um, three main questions. What is the rationale for um, this kind of treatment strategy for Alexander disease? Um, secondly, can it be done? And uh, last, and and certainly not least, what are what are the risks of this as a treatment strategy? Um, so first, what is what is the rationale? Um, so over the years, thanks to really the funding from the National Institutes of Health, we and our collaborators have um, been able to undertake a very broad-based uh, approach for studying how mutations cause disease in Alexander disease, and it includes um, studies just in test tubes, um, in cell culture, like down here, um, in various kinds of model organisms, especially fruit flies in Melfini's lab at Harvard, and in the rodent models that have been the focus of our work in, in Wisconsin. Um, and putting those things along, the data that we get from those kinds of studies alongside what we can learn from, um, from patients. And so one of the general ideas we've one of the general findings from this work over the past 20 years is that um, while it's a, a change in the amino acid sequence of GFAP that causes the disease, another fundamental part of it is that GFAP levels go up. And the GFAP level, the degree to which GFAP is elevated seems to correlate with the severity of disease. And this is demonstrated on the left-hand side of this panel in the mouse models three different measures of GFAP levels, um, and um, with normals all the way on the left-hand side, and then the two different versions of the mice um, on the right-hand side of each of these figures. And then, as well, uh, on the right-hand side in autopsy samples from Alexander patients. This is the Western blot, which shows um, with these horizontal bands uh, and the intensity of those bands how much GFAP is present in their in their brains, and what you've got here, I'll, I'll just explain this in a little bit more detail. A control or a healthy individual is shown all the way on the left. Um, a patient with um, Alzheimer's disease, where there are a lot of uh, reactive changes in astrocytes, is shown here. Another type of uh, adult dementia is shown on the right hand side. So clearly, both Alzheimer's and FTLD have higher levels of GFAP then controls. And then we have six Alexander disease patients um, with the ones with earlier onset uh, on the left-hand side and later onset on the right. And basically, you can see all of the Alexander patients have higher levels of GFAP than the controls. Uh, and the ones with the highest levels are the ones with earliest onset. So you know, this is a very small number of patients, but at least it's consistent with the idea that that well, clearly it demonstrates, again, GFAP levels do go up, and maybe the degree to which it goes up is, is really significant. I see there are a number of questions popping up on the left-hand side. And I, um, for the ones that, that Amy's not able to answer right now, I'll certainly get back to them uh, at the end. 
Okay, so another way in which we can show that that GFP levels are elevated in humans with Alexander disease um, without waiting for autopsies and brain samples are the samples we can get from through the spinal fluid, as was shown in the last presentation. These are things that we published a couple of years ago. And as well, at least in some patients, it's elevated even in blood. Um, and we, from this data, it looked like that was, um, so if you think of these groups, this is based on age of onset. Um, both the infantile onset and juvenile onset patients were statistically elevated compared to controls. The adult onset weren't. But if you think of, the, of them as individuals, really it's just a subset of the, of the patients that had levels that were clearly elevated over control. So, so mainly it's elevated in CSF, and sometimes it's elevated in blood as well. So another thing that we've known for a long time is that um, even separate from the fact that they're, when there are amino acid changes, having too much GFAP is worse than having too little GFAP. And what we did many years ago was create mice that were engineered to have no GFAP at all, and they're reasonably okay, um, whereas mice that just have excess amounts of, of GFAP of a normal sequence, but just much higher than normal, um, are not okay. And even um, the highest producing lines, uh, the mice that produced the most GFAP died within a few weeks after birth. So clearly, having too much GFAP is a problem. And, and that by itself might warrant the idea of just reducing GFAP levels. Oops. Let me go to this slide. So let me um, try to condense a lot of what we've discovered over the past um, 20 years uh, in, uh, in terms of trying to explain what happens after expression of mutant GFAP. And um, first, there's this process of gene transcription. So we have each cell of your body has, has a copy of the GFAP gene. Um, only in some cells is that transcribed and, and leading to production of protein. Um, but then very quickly, in, in the case of Alexander's disease, very quickly after the formation of protein, we see this increase in GFAP start. And some of that is because of feedback loops that lead uh, in a positive feedback loop to an increase in this first step, increase in the gene transcription step. Also very early on, um, probably caused by um, the increased protein, there's activation of a number of other pathways within the cell that we think are actually protective pathways. One of them um, that I'll refer to here is NRF2, and another one that is called CRY-AB. After this, um, there are any number of changes that we've been able to document. Um, uh, we, actually, this isn't really published yet, but um, we do think there is some uh, death of astrocytes. There's uh, a change in the degradation machinery of the cell, the, the machinery that degrades proteins, just even in normal um, cells. There's accumulation of iron. There's a change in a stem cell population that generates new neurons in adults. There's um, at least a suggestion that there's uh, impairment of, of, of a fundamental property of astrocytes, astrocytes of the cell in the brain and spinal cord that produce GFAP. And, um, and there's a suggestion that, that the uptake of glutamate, which is one of the transmitters in the central nervous system, is impaired, um, which would, if, if it's real, result in excess glutamate um, circulating in the extracellular space and maybe toxicity for neurons. Um, there's also aggregation of another very important protein that's been linked to another ne important neurological disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Um, there's also very early activation of another cell type in the brain called microglia, and one result of that would also be another way to um, cause a positive feedback activation of the initial steps here of, of activation of the GFAP gene. So the consequence of, you know, I'm going to stop drawing arrows here. I think the point is that are a lot of things, there are a lot of things happening 
in the disease. And these have already given um, rise to several ideas for treatment. Um, some people have been given a drug that's been um, at least suggested to restore glutamate transport, but honestly, we, we have not proven that glutamate transport is defective, and so we have not really recommended treating with that particular drug. Others have uh, treated people with activators of this pathway, which we believe is protective, but um, again, that's not uh, something that we really would have advocated because based on our own mouse work, we had very compelling data for both of these being protective pathways, but that was using genetic methods, and there was no real clear, really clear way to do this using using drugs. So, so we've been kind of skeptical about this. Uh, others have suggested but not really tried um, drugs that, that are supposed to suppress microglia. Um, so I guess my main point is that there are a lot of things happening and uh, and they've given rise to ideas for treatment, but none of the none of them have been especially compelling uh, on our mind in our minds. Instead, what we decided um, some time ago would be a good a better approach would be to focus on these early steps. Just this this initial um, uh, activation of the GFAP gene that leads to increased protein. And, and if you could prevent that from happening, it would take care of all of these downstream um, consequences of having an abnormal GFAP and and um, increased GFAP. And so specifically, whoops, specifically where uh, where we focused on trying to uh, explore ways to prevent this initial step gene transcription to translation of protein. So I think at this point, let me just pause for a minute to ask if any anybody has questions about this. And I see many of these are in the in the chat box or aimed at Amy Waldman, so I won't. Deal with those yet. Okay, so um, so I think the rationale for this is strong. GFAP is the protein that causes the disease, um, and if we prevent this increase, um, then that would be uh, prevent the increase and also prevent the production of the mutant protein that's that's causative. That would be beneficial. So, the. the Sort of in broad strokes, the rationale of GFAP suppression as a therapeutic strategy is so far GFAP is the only causative gene identified for Alexander disease. Um, we already know that there are other cells besides astrocytes that do produce GFAP, but at much lower levels, and they appear to be unaffected in Alexander disease. Um, and as I mentioned, severity seems to be tied to the level of, of production. So. So there is a key strategic choice, though, that has to be made here, which is to say general suppression versus allele-specific or mutant-specific expression. And I'll come back to that in a little uh, in a little bit. So the next question I want to deal with is this. Okay, if, if there's a good rationale for GFP suppression, how do you do it? And um, over the years, we've tried a number of approaches for doing this, none of which were compelling enough, really, I think, to bring to, to the point of convincing everyone to do a clinical trial. Um, but around uh, four or five years ago, I became aware of the advances that were occurring in the field of antisense therapy for other neurological diseases. and. It was at that point that um, we began this collaboration with Ionis Pharmaceuticals, and um, and that, and that's really what we'll what we're going to be talking about today: the antisense approach. So let me just remind everybody, so we're all on the same page here, so some of the basics of about gene expression, and um, and actually somebody who couldn't participate in today's conference wrote me a um, wrote me a uh, a question about um, asking if I could address it today, and, and 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 so I'll just mention that I'll just address that right now. They asked, for instance, whether 
the gene is present in every cell of the body and um, uh, is it present in astrocytes or neurons? And and so that's that's the reason why I want to go over these basics. So all of us, and, and this is painting in broad strokes, um, all of us basically contain a full set of genes um, in all of our cells. So every cell of our body has copies of the of the GFAP gene, which is in the chromosomes and in the form of, of DNA. Um, only some cells, though, actually express that gene, which is to say the gene is active and it's going through all of these steps shown in this slide. So in all the other cells, for instance, in neurons, GFAP is silent. But in astrocytes, GFAP is very active and it produces very high levels. So the steps that it goes through is, um, first of all, this is at the top, the, the GFAP gene is um, about 18,000 base pairs long. Um, it consists of a regulatory region, sometimes referred to as a promoter, up here. That basically defines how active the gene is. And then the coding region, which basically encodes the amino acid sequence of a protein, in the case of GFAP, is separated into these nine separate blocks um, called exons. And then when the GFAP DNA is transcribed into RNA, then these basic, the, the, the sequences in between the exons get spliced out um, and you end up with a much, much shorter RNA form, um, which is the messenger RNA. So you go from 18,000 base pairs at the DNA level down to only 1,900 base pairs at the messenger RNA level. That message goes from the nucleus out to the cytoplasm. It gets then translated into protein, the GFAP protein, is 432 amino acids long in humans. And so it's this process of DNA to RNA to protein that is what we refer to at, by gene expression. So the, um, I guess the appeal and real promise of antisense is actually just going back here is that mRNA is a very vulnerable step in this whole process. mRNA is very um, fragile. It um, typically doesn't last very long in the cell. And it turns out that there are ways to uh, promote rapid degradation of mRNA um, in a very specific way. And that's the, the beauty of this, this antisense technology that um, uh, where Ionis Pharmaceuticals in California has been one of the pioneers for over 30, 30 years. So um, the antisense drugs that they've developed are in the form of um, short sequences of what are called oligonucleotides that target specifically the mRNA step. So here we have DNA here um, being transcribed into RNA. The antisense can be designed in a way um, based on the sequence that it specifically recognizes just the GFAP mRNA um, and it leads to rapid destruction of that RNA so that in the absence of RNA you're not going to get translation to, pro to protein so it would mean less RNA and less protein. Uh, in addition what they've been, what Ionis has been able to find is that it, you can deliver um, antisense oligonucleotides, and that's just abbreviated ASO here, directly into the CNS uh, or um, central nervous system. Um, in fact, you have to right now, given current technology, that you can't give it um, intravenously, for instance, because it won't cross the blood-brain barrier. But if you administer it even in a, to a single site in the central nervous system, and this is a section of, a, of an animal a rat, and it was administered into the spinal cord here, the black staining here reflects um, the distribution of the antisense, and just administration to a single site leads to widespread distri distribution throughout the central nervous system. Um, so based on their past experience with other disorders, they found that it distributes broadly into the spinal cord and, and brain after CSF delivery, and most importantly, it lasts for a long time. It can last even for months just from that single injection and can be very efficient too. And there 
data from these other disorders includes rodents, dogs, pigs, primates, and even um, and even use in humans. So there is a substantial background for this antisense technology in um, in human medicine. Um, in fact, last year, well, actually it's now 2016, so maybe, uh, where are we, 12, 14 months ago, the FDA approved the first um, drug for spinal muscular atrophy using one of these antisense oligonucleotide approaches. And so, so the FDA already has a fair bit of experience in, in understanding what the risks and benefits are of this kind of approach. So now let me come to the paper. Um, the first thing that IONIS did was identify a number of uh, candidate ASOs that they thought might be active against the GFAP gene. Here's just a diagram of the GFAP gene in the mouse, again showing these exons um, separated by the um, intervening sequences. Um, they identified through a pretty elaborate screening process three particular antisense oligonucleotides that we wanted to try. One was basically aimed at this region of the gene. Two others are aimed here. We would give direct injections into one of the lateral ventricles of the mouse, just as a single injection. And then using normal mice, we looked at levels of GFAP messenger RNA two weeks after that injection. Now, these are adult mice analyzed two weeks later. And you can see animals that are treated with just saline as a control have, uh, let's say, by this um, by this assay, 0.5. Um, animals that are treated with sort of an irrelevant antisense that doesn't uh, isn't thought to recognize anything um, in um, in the RNA of a cell also had levels of 0.5. But each of these three um, antisense, four, five, and nine. Um, resulted in uh, about 80 to 90 percent uh, reduction in the GFAP mRNA levels two weeks after a single injection. Now, in the Alexander mutant mice that we've engineered to be mimics of the human disease, we know that GFAP isn't just at normal levels, it's actually at high levels. So the next, oh, actually before I get to that, just in these normal mice, um, uh, it was important to show that the suppression was long lasting. So this is showing now GFAP mRNA levels um, as a function of time after a single injection. And um, in spinal cord, you can see um, even 16 weeks after injection, so the levels are down to um, less than 10% of normal levels. In other areas, cortex is starting to creep back up. It's still there are long-lasting effects of just the single injection. OK, so what happens in the case of the um, the Alexander mice, where you start out with having very high levels of expression. Um, so what we're looking at here is testing these ASOs in, in mutant mice, again, two weeks after injection. And we're looking at six different levels of the brain, the hippocampus or the central nervous system. The campus, the factory bulb, corpus callosum, cortex, cerebellum, and spinal cord. And in each of these graphs, the normal mice are shown with black symbols. And the Alexander mice are shown in red symbols. And what I'm showing you first is the effect um, of injecting them with saline. So that's just a control. And you can see in each of these um, graphs the expected elevation of the GFAP transcripts that we know happens in, in the mutant mice. And um, that's because of all of those feedback loops that I was talking about before. Um, in the animals that are treated with ASO5, two weeks after injection, it's um, reduced in all of these brain regions, um, essentially, even below the, um, the normal levels, and almost to the equivalent of a complete knockout of GFAP. Um, so basically, there's a very efficient reduction uh, targeting of, of this GFAP mRNA and, and um, an elimination from the central nervous system. Now, mRNA is obviously the first step. That's, that's the target of the antisense. And the goal then is, or the expectation is, that once you have lowered uh, message, that you would stop translation to protein. Um, but some of you know that 
that GFAP is actually a very long-lived protein. And in the mouse, um, the half-life for GF once you synthesize it, then um, eventually it gets degraded. But um, in the mouse, it has a very long half-life. And um, it, it's thought um, there's some data that the half-life would be um, anywhere from four to nine weeks. Um, so just under normal circumstances, it would take that long to get rid of of the GFAP, even if you completely shut down synthesis. So it really wasn't clear what this meant um, in terms of protein levels. And it's really protein that we need to get rid of. So the next slide shows, whoops, the next slide shows, um, yeah, so shows a GFAP protein in hippocampus now eight weeks after a single injection. And we're looking at this in, uh, in terms in a different assay where we're doing a section of brain and then staining it for GFAP. So the brown staining ref, uh, reflects GFAP levels. And you can see saline treated um, mutant animal with abundant GFAP levels over here and an ASO treated animal uh, on the right with marked reduction in, um, in the GFAP staining. So eight weeks after this single injection, we get really a dramatic reduction in GFAP. And if you use a much more quantitative assay, um, which is uh, basically measuring GFAP and extracts, again, you see um, in the saline-treated animals the marked elevation of GFAP um, in, in the mutants compared to the normals. This is just showing two areas, but we've actually done many different areas of the central nervous system. You see the same thing. And the animals treated with the antisense, um, it's essentially gone. And this is really uh, an amazing result. We never expected it to be as efficient as this and as occurring as quickly after after a treatment. Maybe most importantly, uh, many of you know that the hallmark pathology in Alexander disease is the formation of these aggregates within the astrocytes known as Rosenthal fibers. That's shown here right next to um, a lateral ventricle in this mouse, and the, the, the Rosenthal fibers are these really bright red structures within all these astrocytes. In the antisense-treated animals, um, they're gone. And we, before we did this study, you know, there are a lot of predictions about what would happen, and we thought we'd probably be able to gradually get rid of GFAP, but the Rosenthal fibers we all thought were generally resistant to de degradation. That's why they were accumulating. Um, and it turns out um, they're not so resistant. And um, once you shut off synthesis, um, these animals, the astrocytes, are capable of clearing the Rosenthal fibers. So you're essentially reversing pre-existing pathology um, in these brains. Moving ahead to how this might actually play out in a clinical trial setting, of course, we don't want to um, do brain biopsies in order to measure GFAP levels or look at Rosenthal fibers in a patient. That's one of the whole reasons we got interested in looking at CSF. Could CSF measurements instead substitute for um, um, or be an indirect measure of what's in the brain and seeing a response to therapy? And here we're looking at CSF levels in these mice eight weeks after treatment. Again, animals that are treated with saline showing the expected increase. Actually, I should say normal mice have essentially undetectable levels of GFAP in their CSF. Um, but um, there are clearly elevated levels in the mutants or mutants treated with saline, mutants treated with antisense, um, again, essentially back to, to normal levels. So looking ahead to how this might um, contribute to a clinical trial, this is one of the going, to, this is going to be one of the way the main um, measures that will be used in the clinical trial setting to see whether the antisense is actually having the effect that we're predicting it's going to have. So one of the um, so-called clinical <coughs> um, symptoms in the mice, at least, is that um, the, the Alexander mice are much smaller than normals. And if you just look at the left-hand side, of each of these uh, graphs um, at, at the beginning of, of treatment. These are all 
Um, I think these are either eight or twelve week old mice. So they're they're adults. Um, they're they're already showing pretty much maximal effects. And mutants are basically um, half the size of the normal mice um, in both of these sets of experiments. The mutants that are treated with the control um, are sh or the saline are shown here. And so even eight weeks later, they're still significantly smaller than the, the normal mice. But the, I guess you'd call this lavender. Um, this graph in the, in the middle here shows for both of these um, antisynthalgos, for both number four and number nine, um, pretty quickly after treatment, you can see a gradual rise in body weight um, so that at the end of treatment, in fact, they're almost but not quite up to, to the control levels. In fact, statistically, at this point, there's no difference between the, the normal mice and the Alexander mutant mice. So, so this single treatment um, is having uh, a basically a reversal of the underlying pathology and improvement of at least some clinical symptoms. That really, the only clinical symptom that we um, can see in the mice. So, at this point, let me. I'm going to talk about risks, but um, let me just go back through the questions and see if there are any that I want to address right now. Um, okay, so one question. So what we're talking about here is just reducing um, the GFAP message. And, and uh, instead, there's a question about whether you can edit the GFAP gene at the DNA level to remove the mutation. And in theory, there are ways that that could happen. And, um, and some of these are even being applied. Some of you may have heard of this new technology called CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, and some of these are now already um, underway for other disorders. But especially, I think where that's going to really happen first is um, probably in, in disorders of blood. Something outside the central nervous system and in a cell population that's rapidly turning over so that you could do the gene editing in a stem cell that then completely replaces the original population. Applying that technology in the brain in a cell that's not rapidly turning over like astrocytes is a completely different challenge. And so I would say in theory that's possible, but it's a long, long way in the future. And so it's nothing that's that's ready for application right now. Uh, there's a question generally, oh yeah, it's a question about heredity. If my if my daughter received the treatment to reduce her GFAP, will she still pass the disease on? And the answer to that is yes. Um, and it's actually related to the previous question. That person will still um, harbor the abnormal gene at the DNA level, and even though we're preventing the, the expression of the gene in, in terms of translation to protein. So they will harbor that gene. And if they have children later on, they will pass that gene on to their children, to 50% of their children. Uh, Amy's, yeah, Amy's actually bringing up a different point about the gene editing. Um, Yeah, and other people are answering some of these questions, so that's good. Uh, uh, what is the main, so uh, what, one question is about the main difference between Alexander disease and SMA. So spinal muscular atrophy is the disease that I mentioned. Um, there's already an, an ASO treatment approved by the FDA for, for SMA. So SMA is a gene, is a disorder reflecting a um, uh, mutations in a completely different gene. Um, and uh, in terms of the antisense, it gets, uh, it gets a little complicated because um, the mechanism of the antisense in that situation is different. It is fundamentally the same in terms of they've designed ASOs that recognize the SNA transcript and alter its processing. Um, and in terms of the delivery of the antisense and its distribution throughout the, the central nervous system, 
um, that much is the same. But um, I don't want to get into all of the differences between SMA and Alexander disease. SMA is primarily a disorder of neurons. Alexander disease is, is really a disorder of astrocytes. Okay, so there's another question about how many mutations have been discovered in Alexander disease. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, treatment. Okay, so um, okay, so there are two questions I'll take now, and then and then I'll I think we'll come back to some of these later on. If you so the um, you know, the experience with SMA, for instance, in terms of frequency of injections. Um, is important. And as I mentioned, these ASOs have to be delivered directly into the cerebrospinal fluid to be effective. And they are very long lasting, which is why this makes any sense at all. But they don't last forever. So you do have to do repeat administrations. Um, in the case of Alexander disease, what we're, uh, and this is based on the experience with SMA, is that in the trial, it may be done once a month or perhaps once every three to four months. We don't really know. Um, and I think early in the SMA work, they did it monthly, then they moved to once every three months. Um, in clinical application, uh, it still may be changing. Uh, now, I think they started out once every three months, and I'm not sure where they are right now. So it does have to be done repeatedly. So far, they're not aware of any um, harmful side effects of having to do those repeat administrations. Um, and in the um, Alexander mice, the question was, how long did it last in the Alexander mice? And we, we're, um, we don't completely know the answer to that question. We're in the process of of doing those kinds of experiments right now. So clearly, um, what we published showed that um, the, the, effect, the effect started to be apparent within two to four weeks after injection. And then we're showing the most dramatic effects on body weight, for instance. That's eight weeks after injection. And now in the ongoing studies, we're going up to 16 and, um, and I think 32 weeks. So, so those experiments are underway. Okay, so with that, let me go on to um, just review the fact that these, the bottom line here is that these ASOs can achieve substantial and sustained reduction of GFAP mRNA after a single injection. Excuse me, it also eliminates nearly all of the GFAP protein, dissolution of Rosenthal fibers, and reduction of many downstream mark, uh, markers of pathology and the GFAP levels in CSF at least could act as a biomarker in clinical trials. There's an important reminder here, and that is that the ASOs they, that we have used in this study are specific to rodent GFAP. And basically, in order to be able to tar recognize human GFAP, um, they have to be remade. And, um, and that is uh, a, a that's a process that's underway at Ionis Pharmaceuticals right now. But this is where um, we don't have a guarantee of success. We have every expectation that this um, re-engineering of ASOs to target human JFAP is going to go along according to plan. But you know, until we're there, we're not there. And so that's why we're hoping by, um, certainly by the end of this year, will know the answer to that. Do they really have um, ASOs that can efficiently target human GFVP the way it did in the mouse? OK. Um, so now, and I know there are some other questions, but I will come back to those later. I think it's important to talk about um, how we assess risk of this treatment. And um, one issue is that there are too many um, mutations or variants for an allele-specific approach. And, and I think there was a question before, how many different mutations are there? Um, and this is a diagram of the GFAP protein. Each of these small symbols represents a patient. Um, all of the early onset ones are on the left-hand side. 
later onset are on the right hand side. It shows them the locations of these mutations along the length of the protein. There are a few what we call hot spots where the number of, patient, of patients have been identified, but there are many where um, and even maybe two thirds where only they're called private mutations. Only a single person has ever been identified with that. And this is a diagram that we published um, almost nine years ago. So, and it, we haven't updated it because it was getting too crowded. Um, I'm still keeping track of what's published and I know about. And so, um, at last count, there are over 117 different mutations affecting over, I think it's 73 of the amino acids in GFAP. So, what an allele-specific approach would mean is that for R239C, for instance, there would be a specific treatment that would be different than for R88C. And um, that's where there, you know, you'd have to engine, you'd have to create individualized treatments for um, you know, 117 different people. And um, just because of the rarity of the disease and the cost of developing these treatments, uh, I, I don't think that's going to happen right now, at least not by this approach. So rather than an allele-specific approach, what we've done is try the approach of general suppression. We just get rid of all of the GFAP, both the abnormal GFAP and the normal GFAP. And the reason we think that's a reasonable thing to try is based on um, uh, experience with engineering animals that have no GFAP at all. Now, having said that, um, you know, going into this, there's a lot of concern. Um, and let me start out with evolutionary considerations. GFAP appears very early in the evolution of vertebrates. It's not in lampreys, but it does appear in spiny dogfish. And um, if you think about GFAP at the amino acid level, between cows and human, 94% of the amino acids are absolutely identical. And even between mouse and human, 90% are identical. And you go down to fish, and it's 67% identical. So in terms of evolutionary considerations, this is a very highly conserved protein. And so um, everyone would have expected that if you, you're conserving a protein through this span of evolution, which in rough terms is around 300 million years. It's got a very critical function and you can't do without it. Um, so the surprise that really came to us starting maybe 20 years ago is that if you engineer um, animals, in particular mice, that have no GFAP at all, we and three other groups found that those mice are almost entirely normal. We've just recently engineered rats um, and we haven't published this yet, but they they look like the mice. They're, they're pretty much okay. And just recently, another group reported that frogs and toads have naturally deleted GFAP. And so they, are, they certainly are born and grow up to adulthood and, and show no apparent ill effects of not having GFAP at all. So GFAP deficiency is clearly very different than this. So having an abnormal GFAP sequence is clearly a much worse situation than having no GFAP at all. So that's what's given us confidence about really taking this idea of general suppression uh, in the first place. And the fact that the, the antisense approach that we've just published is so efficient and actually creates a the equivalent of a null state um, it is a surprise to us, but that's where we have to, you know, we, we can only look to these kinds of animals to say, well, what does this tell us about risk? So it tells us something, but, you know, I have to say that um, there are caveats about using GFAP null rodents as a, guise, as a guide for risks in humans. First of all, what we did in the mouse is that we did, it's called a developmental deletion. So basically from conception, those animals have no GFAP. And maybe that's different than suppressing it acutely in an adult. That's an experiment we can do now using the antisense approach in normal animals. And you know, so far, we don't see any effects. But still, there is this issue. 
I would say looking at GSAP knockouts or nulls um, and what has been published in the literature, there are some effects, but most, if not all of these, have only been documented, documented once. And so we don't really know how um, reliable those reports are. And finally, and most importantly, there are, there are differences, small but perhaps meaningful, between GFAP in humans and the GFAP in mouse and rats, as well as astrocytes in humans and astrocytes in mouse and rat. And so, so ultimately, I think what this tells us is that um, our antisense study shows us um, a very clear, the first real um, uh, prospect for a treatment for Alexander disease. But we, we can't say it's without risk. And the only way to address these kinds of questions is through a, a clinical trial in human patients. And so that's where we come back to the presentation at the beginning by Amy Waldman and why it's so important to do a, um, a clinical trial. So I think that may be the last of my slides. And yeah. So now let me go back to all the questions that have accumulated. Um, um, okay, so you know, I think a lot of these questions, I'll just take the questions in order right now. And uh, so we may bounce back and forth a little bit. I think, and some of them um, also touch on the question of who would be included in a clinical trial and ultimately who would benefit from the treatment. And as, as Amy Waldman said, really, there are a lot of issues about inclusion criteria and clinical trial design. And, and my main point about asking you to address that is that we haven't reached any consensus about, about that now. And, it, and it's really a very active topic of discussion all the time. But we just don't know. Um, so there is a question, though, about if somebody like when would treatment be most effective? And I think as is true for most diseases, the earlier you can institute treatment, the more effective it will be. Um, and so I think there's, there is a point um, at which people may be so severely affected and the abnormalities in their brain and spinal cord are so severe that even shutting down the production of the mutant protein um, will not really um, produce a meaningful benefit. Um, but we don't know what that point is. So, you know, it, it's most likely that in a clinical trial, we would probably, because we're looking for a clear answer about whether these things are beneficial, uh, that we would be looking at people at earlier stages. But, um, but you know, I, again, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, there's a question about uh, patients outside, could patients outside the US need to visit treatment every time from the UK? Um, well, so that is the question about whether, how many sites there would be. And, um, and I think the, um, we are, I think, the most recent discussion was that there would be multiple sites and not just in the United States. Um, but uh, the way I understand this, um, that means people would have to uh, visit those sites. And it is a fairly limited number. You know, Dr. Walton was talking about four, maybe total. Um, they would have to visit those sites for the injections. And there may be some period of monitoring um, for a certain period of time before and after the, each of those injections, too, where they would have to visit that site. Um, so then there's questions again, what's the response to treatment? Would people, and this is really just predictions on my part, of course. So based on, you know, basically would a, would a treatment lead to somebody um, improving or would it simply stop the progressive decline. And um, certainly it looks from the mouse data that they would improve. But you know, the mice are not nearly as severely affected as many humans. So I can't 
you know, directly translate that to human. But I think this also um, comes back to the question of when you institute treatment. So the earlier you would start treatment, then the more likely you would be to get improvement. And the later you would start treatment in a disease course, you know, um, maybe at best you're going to stop progression, but um, but you'd have less chances for improvement. Um, so do you have any idea about the typical cost of these injections from SMA studies? And um, you know, that's a really complicated question. And I would have to, and I, first of all, I want to say that Ionis Pharmaceuticals is um, not the company that set the prices. They, they licensed it with SMA. They licensed the, um, the compounds to other companies. The other companies set prices. The prices, in my mind, are extremely high and not realistic. And it's, a, um, I think it's under a constant process of of uh, of evolution. So I think the company set those prices just as a matter of starting the discussion, and then they would figure out later on how anyone is going to pay for it. But the prices they set are not anything people like us can afford. Um, and that was just from SMA. Um, so I, you know, I, and I'm glad SMA is leading the way on that, so that Alexander disease doesn't have to be the um, um, the pioneer in those pricing. Um, uh, does Waste and Center need more funding? Of course, we. Um, you know, I should say that we've been very, uh, we've been funded very generously by the NIH over the years, but almost none of that has been for this um, therapeutic research. And the only reason that we've gotten to where we are now was because of private fund fundraising that was done. Um, initially, um, the family of Jack Palomaro um, set up a fund at the Raceman Center, um, and it, it still exists. Uh, uh, the family of Jelte Ricart in the Netherlands also did fundraising. Um, Elise's Corner has, has made uh, important contributions. Um, Adrian Harvey in UK um, has really raised significant amounts of, months, uh, of funds. Um, and really in a different, uh, and those are all important, but, but um, overall it was really the um, incredible effort of Tony Pinoy in Spain um, back in 2008 and 2009 that provided us with the funds that, that let us keep going um, all this time and to get us where we are. And, you know, some of you know that Tony sadly passed away in, in October of last year, um, really just weeks before I could tell her how far and how successful we had gotten with the, with the anti science treatment. So um, it's really um, private donors that have been critically important um, for us throughout this whole process. Um, and that's both at the Wayson Center and now through these other sites that are actively engaged in research, um, such as Dr. Waldman's group at, at CHOP. Um, so do you observe muscle wastage in Alexander patients? So there's, um, and you know, there's the, uh, so there are two reasons why, why you get muscle wastage. One is, um, Inactivity. So simply immobilizing a limb, you know, if you break a leg and you're putting a cast uh, and you're not exercising your muscles, um, you get muscle wastage. Uh, but many Alexander patients have um, also difficulty eating and swallowing. And so they experience a form of malnutrition from that. Um, and so that's, that's another reason why you have um, loss of body fat and, and muscle wastage. Um, and then in addition, I, I think there's something else going on with body weight. And we've seen this both with our, with our mice, and now we also have a new rat model that we haven't published yet, but certainly we'll be talking about at the conference this summer. And so I think there may be other reasons underlying abnormalities of body weight and body fat beyond simply inactivity and difficulty swallowing uh, and, and eating. Um, 
And I think I think I've addressed all of the questions. So, um, you know, overall, um, so is there an identified food that helps these patients? Um, no, I'm not really the right person to ask about that. That would be a good question for, for Dr. Waldman. Certainly, you know, bypassing the mouth and throat and, and administering nutrition directly into the stomach or even the intestines through the so-called G-tubes or GJ tubes is, is one thing that's done for, pa for patients who really need it and, and helps. So, um, you know, I can wait a little bit for more questions, but just let me summarize by saying that, um, you know, we, we first discovered the uh, GFAP as a genetic cause for Alexander disease um, over about 20 years ago. Um, maybe about 15 years ago, we started uh, on this goal of, of developing a, um, an effective treatment. And I think it's really just within the first, the past three to four years, and now with this publication, that I, I, I think we're really on a path to success. It's not a perfect treatment. Um, you know, it would require these periodic infusions into um, into the CSF. Um, we can continue thinking about continue thinking about um, the future and improvements even even on this current approach. But I uh, I think we we are finally on a path to a clinical trial, and hopefully by this summer we'll know more about um, um, about what those prospects are. So um, with that, let me. Say goodbye. Um, Clark is putting in the website for the um, for the details about the family conference, and um, we hope to see you there. For those of you who might be in touch with others who haven't been able to listen to this presentation, we will have it. We've recorded it, and we'll have it archived and posted on our website, hopefully within a week. So, thank you again, and I hope to see you in August. Bye bye.